Hello everyone, my name is Pixel Riffs, and welcome back to the Minecraft Survival Guide. I hope you're all having a good day. So you've been to the Nether, and you've encountered a Nether Fortress. You brought home some blaze rods, you are now growing Nether Wart outside of your base, but what do you do with all of this? What do you do with these mysterious blaze rods or this gross looking Nether Wart? And how did the piglins that you bartered some gold with give you a potion. What is this all about? Well, today we're going to examine some of that in an early introduction to brewing. Brewing is a really useful thing to have at this stage of Minecraft because it allows us to maybe take on some more superhuman properties a little bit. The resistance to fire, the ability to breathe underwater for longer periods of time, even the ability to turn invisible or see better at night. We're going to grab a little bit of stuff from in here, and then we're going to go down to our basement where we're going to start up our brewing operation. And we probably have a workbench or something like that over here that we can use. Maybe we can just put the brewing stand on top of these barrels. To create a brewing stand in the first place, I'll need to remember where my cobblestone chest is. There we go. We'll grab three cobblestone from in here. We'll put that in the crafting table as a base. We'll put one blaze rod on top of that, and we get this excellent piece of apparatus. The brewing stand is where we will be doing most of our potion brewing. Of course, no brewing setup would be complete without a cauldron. This is actually half a joke, because cauldrons, while they do have some function in brewing, aren't really all that useful. Uh, they're useful for a bunch of other things, but for brewing, especially in Java Edition Minecraft, they are not all that great, which we'll get onto in a second. The next thing we need to do is grab some glass, if once again I can remember where the glass chest is. My labeling system here is perhaps not the best. With glass, we can make ourselves three glass bottles, and they will be empty glass bottles for now. We actually got traded a full glass bottle by one of the piglins in the previous episodes. And from this cauldron, which we've dumped a bucket of water into, we can fill up these glass bottles with the three layers of water inside the cauldron. Each one will fill up a glass bottle, and those can go in our brewing stand here, ready to be filled with whatever potion ingredients we want to throw into them. But you'll notice there is a catalyst needed for the brewing process. Up here in this top left hand corner is the outline of an item called blaze powder, which is acquired very simply by breaking down a blaze rod in your crafting interface. We'll grab those, we'll put one of them in here, and you'll notice that fills up this little bar here, indicating that the brewing stand is ready to brew. Now, it's important that you don't break the brewing stand right now, not because anything bad is going to happen necessarily, but you would lose all of the fuel in here. So make sure you put down your brewing stand somewhere that it's at least going to be set up for a little while before you add any fuel to it, because breaking it, that fuel will end up being lost. The basis of almost all potions, with one notable exception, is nether wart, which is why it's so important that we got this stuff from the nether in the first place. There are lots of ingredients that go into potion brewing, but nether wart is the one that starts off 99% of the potions we're going to be brewing. And as you can see, it starts bubbling here on the left hand side and this arrow slowly fills up much as it does in a furnace when it's smelting something. And eventually the brewing stand will make a bubbling noise and each of these bottles of water will be transformed into an awkward potion. Now, the Awkward Potion, as it says, has no effects right now. It's not actually going to do anything for us. And if we take it out of the brewing stand, we still get an advancement for that because you have to brew something in a brewing stand and that's what we've done. But it's not going to do anything if we drink it. It's effectively going to be the same as drinking a bottle of water. So we're going to leave that in the brewing stand and we're going to add in another ingredient that's going to help us turn these potions into something a bit more useful. Since we've got it on us right now, I'm going to add the blaze powder into the ingredients slot of this, and once again, you'll notice this starts bubbling, the arrow starts moving, and eventually these will turn into three potions of strength. So the process always begins with nether wart, the transformative component in this case was blaze powder, and that gets us a potion of strength that will last, as the duration indicator says there, for three minutes, giving us a plus three bonus to our attack power. We can now take those out of the brewing stand, and if we wanted to, we could drink one of them in much the same way that you eat food, simply by holding down right click, and those would be pretty effective, getting us out of difficult combat situations. But each potion has a couple of things you can do to upgrade it once the base potion has been brewed. Let's walk over here to our chest where we have 
a little bit of glowstone dust and I'll show you actually we can do something fun here. We can actually take out one of the potions in the brewing stand and if we add in another ingredient, in this case we're going to add in some glowstone dust, it will still brew up two of these potions without a third being present. Or if you crafted a few different potions at this point, you can apply the glowstone dust to all of them. What glowstone dust does is intensify the effect of the potion. So now we have a potion of strength 2, which lasts for half the time, but deals twice the amount of damage. So there's a bit of a trade-off here. If you want to do a bunch of damage really fast and have the potion effect run out faster, you can brew it with glowstone to make a strength 2 potion. Since we've set this up here, we're actually going to put the potions in the barrel below the brewing stand so that we know where those are. Let's make ourselves a few more glass bottles and we're going to find something to replace the cauldron because as you can see, it's completely run out of water at this point and there's a way we can have a permanent source of water for our potion bottles. And that is simply by collecting them from a full source block of water. If we right click on any water block with these potion bottles, it will refill without depleting the water the way it does with a cauldron. So I'm going to take a bucket of water, I'm going to get rid of some of the creepers that have spawned around here during the night. And we'll actually take this gunpowder because we can use that for some potion brewing. Back down in the basement, we're going to remove the cauldron from our brewing setup. And if we wanted to, we could probably just dig a hole in here, throw a, a water bucket down there. And if I drink this bottle of water here for absolutely no effect, if we right click on that water source, you can see that we can fill up our water bottles from that nice and easily. So we're going to throw three more potions in the brewing stand. We're going to put in a nether wart as per usual, and you'll notice I've picked up a bit of redstone dust as well. Like with glowstone dust, redstone dust can be added to the potion after it has some sort of effect, and the redstone dust will serve to lengthen the status effect. So if we put this splash potion of fire resistance in there and added some redstone dust, it would lengthen the duration that the fire resistance effect lasted. In fact, let's brew up some fire resistance potions of our own now that we have what we need. We only have a couple of slime balls in here, and we have a little bit more blaze powder that we can break down. And combining these will get us magma cream. Magma cream is something that magma cubes in the nether will drop. But if you haven't encountered one of those yet, if you haven't been in the right biome, or you're simply too scared to wander into a basalt delta, which I know I am a lot of the time, we can grab some magma cream. We can throw that into the brewing stand. And this will make us three potions of fire resistance. And the reason we're leaping into brewing right away after only having visited the nether for a couple of episodes is because fire resistance potions are kind of a staple if you want to spend a lot of time in the nether. There will be some pretty much unavoidable situations in which you encounter lava and if you're not quick with your reflexes or you get thrown off a cliff by a hoglin or something like that, you're going to find yourself needing to drink a fire resistance potion pretty quickly to avoid the damaging effects of lava, which can of course destroy a bunch of your items if you die in there. So we're going to give ourselves the maximum amount of time with fire resistance by brewing these up with some redstone dust. And once that operation completes, we should see the fire resistance potion lengthen in its duration from three minutes to eight minutes. There we go. So it more than doubles the amount of time a fire resistance potion will last for. And of course, that means 24 minutes potentially of uninterrupted resistance to fire or lava. As we discussed in the previous episode, fire resistance potions are also really useful when dealing with blazes, which means you can drink a fire resistance potion and have eight minutes of virtually uninterrupted combat with blazes without having to worry about being on fire all of the time and that will allow you to grab a bunch more blaze rods that you can continue to use for potion brewing. For another fantastic application of potion brewing, we need to return to our fisherman's shack where he has been storing all the puffer fish that he's caught during his adventures. And by he, I mean me. This is my house. I have two houses now. This barrel here stores all the puffer fish. We're going to grab one of those, bring it back to our brewing stand, fill up a few more bottles from our infinite water source, add nether warts, add puffer fish, and presto, we have three potions of water breathing, which will last for three minutes. Now we're going to add the redstone dust in there. So much like the fire resistance, the water breathing effect will last for much longer. There we go, eight minutes of water breathing is ours, so 24 minutes total. And you'll notice that the fuel gauge in our brewing stand has gone down a little bit. After we've been brewing a few of these potions, it's decreased to almost halfway. Each 
blaze powder that you add in here will provide fuel for up to 20 brewing operations. And naturally, we can leave some blaze powder in here so that as soon as this fuel depletes entirely, it gets replenished with another 20 operations worth of brewing. Now for the amount that I use them, fire resistance and water breathing potions are two of the most important potions in the game. And there is one more important potion which might be a little strange if it's your first time hearing about this. This is actually the one potion which doesn't require you to put nether wart into the brewing stand at all. Instead, we'll need to go to our mob drops and pick up a spider eye. Rummage in our organic chest to see if we have any brown mushrooms, which we do not. So let's go out and grab some brown mushrooms real quick. And on the way, we'll grab one piece of sugar cane that we can break down into sugar. Now, where am I going to find brown mushrooms in this area? There are a few places we can look, actually, since on natural world generation, mushrooms will generate in darker areas such as caves. You can find them in swamp biomes or the tigers that have two by two spruce trees. Dark oak forests have examples of giant mushrooms, which if you find one of the brown variants, you can break down some of the cap blocks until it drops a couple of brown mushrooms. Occasionally while exploring ocean biomes, you might even run into a mushroom island that is covered in mushrooms of all kinds, both brown and red. Or occasionally you will find them growing in various biomes in the nether. So by combining a spider eye, brown mushroom and some sugar, we get a fermented spider eye, which is the primary ingredient in a potion of weakness. And once again, is the only potion which can be brewed without using nether wart first. Those were full glass bottles of water when I put them in the brewing stand. I did not add any nether wart to them. We still got a potion of weakness. And these, if you consume them, will have the opposite effect of a potion of strength. They will actually reduce the attack damage you do. So why are we brewing these in the first place? It doesn't sound like a very advantageous thing at all. Well, we can add some gunpowder into the recipe and that will make these into splash potions of weakness, similar to the splash potion of fire resistance that we were traded by the piglins in our first exploration in the nether. Once the brewing stand bubbles, we will get three splash potions of weakness, and these, as the name suggests, can be splashed on things, either on the player or on other mobs, and in some cases, you might even want to use them defensively to throw them at zombies or whatever is attacking you so that it deals a little bit less damage to you as a player. But these have a hidden purpose. They are actually a key ingredient in curing zombified villagers. And that is something we'll do in a future episode. We're not going to cover it today because it really deserves a whole episode by itself. And we haven't really encountered a village yet in this series. But we're going to store those away. And now that we've introduced potion brewing, hopefully now you know how to craft splash potions of weakness. Now the splash effect can, as you might expect, be applied to any type of potion. We could make splash potions of water breathing if we wanted to, and we'd be able to splash them on ourselves before we went diving. Splash potions in multiplayer, of course, can also apply to a variety of players all standing in one place. So if you and your friends want to cluster up, throw a potion in the air and have it land on all of your heads at once, then you'll all get a certain amount of the water breathing effect. But it's worth noting that how you throw the potion has some effect on this, and I'm going to demonstrate by going back through to the nether and demonstrating this splash potion of fire resistance now that we've had the opportunity to brew some of our own. So with my gold helmet back on, I have stepped back into the nether. And if we end up throwing this potion up in the air and it lands on our heads, we will get the full three minutes of fire resistance that this thing advertises. If I throw it on the ground at my feet, however, you'll notice that we only get about two and a half minutes, maybe a little bit extra. So it's actually kind of important where you throw them, and I'm only doing this for demonstration purposes. You can, of course, if you're facing this way, throw them directly in front of you, and then you won't get any of the potion effect at all. It will land on whatever you're throwing it at. But fire resistance, scary though it might seem, allows us to go for a swim in lava with virtually no effect whatsoever. And in fact, we can now ride the lava upwards, maybe a little bit slower than we might normally, the same way that we would with water in the overworld. Now, of course, fire resistance is not going to make you invulnerable permanently. You can still take fall damage if you're climbing out of a lava column like that. And, of course, 
it will set you on fire regardless of whether or not you have the fire resistance effect. I believe in Bedrock Edition this might be different and you don't get set on fire at all, but I could be wrong about that fact. Either way, when we end up coming through the lava here, we'll stay on fire for a couple of seconds afterwards, and actually any amount of fire protection you have on your armor will decrease the time that you stay on fire after having stepped into fire or lava or anything like that. In fact, I can set a fire right here to show you the same applies to fire as well. I can stand in this fire block, my face completely on fire, and take no damage whatsoever. But that only lasts until the potion effect runs out, which the potions HUD here in your inventory will give you some indication of how quickly that happens. You'll also notice that there is a potion indicator in the top right hand corner showing that I currently have the fire resistance effect and when it starts to wear off that potion indicator will flash a little bit. It will dim and brighten again just to let you know that the effect has about 10 seconds left before it wears off entirely and if we're standing in lava when that happens probably not a good thing to do. <laughs> so having waited around in the nether for just about long enough we have 10 seconds of the effect left and as you can see that potion is flicking a little bit in the potions hut in the top right corner. There is a hoglin somewhere that I'd probably better watch out for, and finally, the effect wears off. Now, if I step into lava, I am toast, so I'm not going to do it again. But there you go, that's a demonstration of how fire resistance works. Anyway, back in the overworld, we need to track down a few more spiders, because there's a lot more we can do with fermented spider eyes than just brew potions of weakness. And though I kind of hate the idea, I think I know where we can go to get a guarantee of some spider eyes. That's right, it's back to the lush cave abandoned mineshaft, where we're going to take out some of the torches and a cave spider spawns immediately. <laughs> I wasn't even ready with my sword at that point. Come on then. Yeah, I should probably put my regular helmet back on for this one and <laughs> we're going to make sure that the area around here isn't quite so well lit just so the spiders have a chance at spawning. One of these days, we're definitely going to come back here and turn this into a full scale mob farm for XP and a few other things. So look out for that in a future episode. Maybe not this week, but who knows? <laughs> in the meantime, we're at least able to get a couple more spider eyes from these guys, so I'm going to grab a few more and we'll see what we can do with them once we're back at the house. Yep, I opened this out a little bit more and three of them came at me, so I now have three more spider eyes and that's quite enough for me, thank you very much. Okay, having gathered up a few more brown mushrooms as well, I just need to grab some sugarcane out of my organic chest. We'll bring four of that so that we can craft that down into four sugar. We'll make three fermented spider eyes and we'll start brewing up a couple more useful potions. And I did take a quick trip through the nether and ended up with a little bit more pork to my name as well. So filling up three more glass bottles, we're going to throw a nether wart in here and then we're going to add some sugar to make a potion of swiftness. While that brews up, we're going to grab some melon slices and do we still have some gold in here? Yes, we do. Okay, I left it in there after our last trip to the nether. Let's break that down into some gold nuggets. We're going to put a melon slice in here and surround it with gold nuggets to make a glistering melon slice, which is no longer a piece of food, but is a potion brewing ingredient. For now, we'll take out these potions of swiftness, which are obviously going to give us a little bit of extra speed. You can intensify those with glowstone dust or increase the duration in the same way that you can with the potions of fire resistance and water breathing. We're going to leave the swiftness potions in here for a second. We'll leave one in our inventory and tuck it to the side there. Once this nether wart starts brewing down, we're going to add the glistering melon slice into the brewing stand, and that's going to give us some potions of healing. To demonstrate those, I'm going to take my armor off here and just get myself a little bit of damage that I'm not about to heal up with the, uh, yeah, the hunger bar depleting enough. That, yeah, that should be enough. I can stop being on fire now, please. Thank you. Oh, goodness. Right, now, now that the glistering melons have brewed into potions of instant health, these are kind of unique in that they don't have a duration like some of the other potions do. In fact, the name says it all. They are instant, meaning if I drink a potion of healing, I automatically recover two hearts of health, just like that. And in fact, I feel like getting another potion of healing just so I can feel a little bit safer, and then I'm going <laughs> to eat the rest of this steak to heal fully back up again. So now we have a couple of glass bottles that we can reuse. We have one last instant health potion in here, and we have a potion of swiftness that we can put back in here as well, because I want to demonstrate that if we put a fermented spider eye in the brewing stand, it inverts some potions so the effects are reversed. And once it's done brewing down, we're going to see that with the potion of health and the potion of swiftness, which turn into a potion of harming, which deals instant damage, and a potion of slowness, which inflicts 
a negative buff to our speed, or of course the speed of whoever you want to chuck it at, because the idea behind these potions is that you apply gunpowder to them to make them splash potions and hurl them at your enemies. Naturally, you wouldn't want to drink a potion of harming yourself, because if you did, there we go, we just got three damage. So they actually are a little bit more powerful than the healing potions are, and I mainly did that so I could get the glass bottle back, and we could brew some more potions after that. But not every potion is going to have an inverse effect. So if I put the fermented spider eye in here with a potion of water breathing and a potion of fire resistance, it's not going to do anything to either of them, because there is no fire vulnerability potion or, you know, a potion of drowning. It's not going to work that way. In single player, you're not going to worry too much about most of the negative effects of potions since you're not engaging in the kind of combat where you're going to be throwing potions as a surprise attack. I find that fermented spider eyes are mostly useful just for making potions of weakness. Because as I mentioned earlier, curing villagers can be incredibly worthwhile. But we're going to pop these potions back in here for now, and I think we'll round out this episode by demonstrating the effects of a potion of water breathing. Because if we dive down below the surface around here, there are actually some caves that we can explore which are below the surface of the water that we would drown if we ended up exploring in great detail. But I wonder if my diamond helmet is now capable of getting an enchantment like, yes, aqua affinity. Perfect. Okay, let's throw that on the helmet now and see what else we get in terms of enchantments. Protection 4. Okay, fantastic. So aqua affinity is a really useful enchantment in tandem with potions of water breathing because aqua affinity allows you to mine underwater at the same speed that you mine on land. It basically means that the slowdown that happens when you're underwater mining no longer applies. And so if I drink a potion of water breathing and hop on down here, we can swim around and you'll notice that our breath meter there, our oxygen meter, does not deplete. So we are really well kitted out for exploring underwater now. We have some aqua affinity on our helmets, we have a potion of water breathing, and we have depth strider on our boots, which allows us to move underwater exactly at the same speed as we do on land. So once again, we're able to come down here, mine out all of this stuff, and we can get hold of some more resources this way. There are some tight spaces and interesting twists and turns down here, but dive mining like this is actually a really interesting way of getting hold of some precious resources, because the game will generate more resources in areas which aren't exposed to the air, and that includes areas like this which are flooded with water, so there's a chance that we might even be able to pick up some more lapis, redstone, diamonds, and other precious resources while we're down here exploring these caves. One unfortunate problem for me making this YouTube video is that a lot of light sources cannot be placed underwater, so making air pockets for your light sources is often a good idea, but as soon as water floods into them, of course, they're going to be destroyed. Now, we could end up using some full block light sources like glowstone or jack-o'-lanterns, which could be placed underwater. In fact, let me return to the surface and grab a few more jack-o'-lanterns so we can light it up down here. Using our shears, we're going to right-click on some of these pumpkins so that we can get them in their carved form, and crafting those together with the torches will give us five jack-o'-lanterns that we can use as we maneuver around these caves. We still have nearly five minutes left on our water breathing, so we can swim around here, place a jack-o'-lantern, take a quick look around to see if there are any resources that we would miss in the dark, pick it up and then swim on. Glow Lichen will also generate down here, which can sometimes light up this area, but look at this. This area down here is a pretty much full cave. There is a geode right here, which we wouldn't have found otherwise, because this is more or less directly under our house. And let's see if we can mine through the wall here and open this out and see if there's anything we can grab from the inside. There we go, this place is wonderful. There are some fully grown amethyst crystals down here because this geode has been down here since we've been exploring this area, growing its crystals, and we can even get out into the cave down here and continue looking for resources. Fantastic. There's a bunch more iron down here, there's some coal, and of course I'll have to keep an eye on my potion gauge because I don't want to get caught down here without air, but it looks like there are at least some magma blocks down here, which will create these bubble columns that drag you down, but if you hold shift on them, you won't end up taking damage like you do on regular magma blocks, and you'll be able to replenish your oxygen meter if you need to. Now the cave goes further down into the depths of the world and there are lots of twists and turns down here. We're not quite deep enough that I'm likely to see a whole bunch of diamonds quite yet, but there's definitely some gold and occasionally it surfaces into a cave and I have no idea what just hit me, but there 
is an abandoned mine shaft right here. <laughs> Incredible. This is a cave that I might not have found were it not for diving down there with water breathing. And as you can see, the cave extends further below us. This is a really exciting place, actually. I think I'll have to come back and explore this in a future episode. But for now, I think we need to swim back to the surface while our water breathing potion holds. We found some really cool stuff right here at the end of the episode, all thanks to the potions we've been brewing up at our brand new brewing stand. But it is nighttime once again, so it's time to return to the safety and security of our house and call it an episode there. Folks, I hope you've enjoyed this look at potion brewing and its advantages. We can see that we've got a lot of very, very cool stuff that we can go out and look for now thanks to these potion effects. And that's going to be it for this episode of the Minecraft Survival Guide. Thank you so much for watching. My name has been Pixorifs. Don't forget to leave a like on this episode if you enjoyed it. Subscribe if you want to see more and I'll see you folks soon. Take care. Bye for now.